I get asked this question all the time. Why did this happen to my loved one? When you work homicides, this question is going to be asked by every victim family. I can remember a time when I was asked this question by a family of a very young girl who was kidnapped in our city and killed. And as, as her name I'll use for purposes of this illustration is Jackie. Why would anyone do something like this to Jackie? Well, the answer to these kinds of questions are always complex. They always involve a series of explanations that we puzzle together as detectives to know uh, why this happened or to discover why this happened. Look, Jackie was the kind of girl who would get in a car, the car of a stranger. If she wasn't that kind of girl, this crime doesn't happen. And this happened on a holiday where her parents said, get out, get out and play. Don't come back in here for a couple hours. We're making dinner. Okay, if it's on a holiday and she isn't the kind of girl who gets in a car, this doesn't happen. Two factors have to be in place. Two things have to be perfectly in place before this can happen. Third, the person who did this was somebody who has a, a, probably I've worked these kinds of suspects before, and usually the kinds of people who would do this to a young child have had a disturbing upbringing of their own. If there isn't somebody out there who has had that disturbing upbringing, if this isn't a holiday, and she's not the kind of kid who gets into her car, this doesn't happen. Three conditions have to be met. And this is a part of our city which was really niche. It wasn't close to a major highway. I mean, how would you even know to get in that part of the city and how to get back out again? If you don't know that part of the city well and you're not the kind of person who's been raised with this kind of disturbing background and, and, you, you know, and she isn't the kind of kid who gets in a car and it's not a holiday, four things have to be in place or this doesn't happen. Also, he had to have the kind of vehicle that would actually facilitate this kind of crime. A fifth thing. And a sixth thing, he has to have a time frame that's very, very narrow in which to do this and actually be able to successfully complete it and get rid of her body. Pretty gruesome stuff, right? But look at my diagram. These six things have to be in place, and they actually explain why this happened to Jackie. And you'll notice I've drawn some connections here. We have to not only figure out these six things, we have to figure out what relationship these six things have to each other that might have affected why this crime occurred the way it did. Do you see how complex answering the question, why did this happen to Jackie, actually is? There's not an easy answer to this. We've talked about seven pieces of evidence so far. Here's a diagram of all seven pieces that I think are best explained by the existence of God outside the room. But now we're going to add an eighth piece, evil. And some people would say that that eighth piece is actually the best reason not to believe in God. I mean, think about it. You might have seven good reasons to believe this suspect committed the crime, but if he tells you he wasn't even in the country and he can demonstrate that he wasn't there, he wasn't in the country at the time of the murder, he's got an alibi, then I don't care how good your seven pieces are, you've misinterpreted them. He clearly didn't do it. Is this what evil is when it comes to God? Is evil, is that actually called exculpating evidence? Does evil exculpate God as a suspect in this case? Think about it. How could an all-loving, all-powerful God allow that to happen to Jackie? Either he's not all-powerful and he couldn't stop it, or he's not all-loving and he didn't care to stop it, or he doesn't exist. So we need to look at this issue of evil. Why would a loving, all-powerful God allow any act of evil to occur? That's a very similar question to why would a suspect do what they did to Jackie? Well, I think, again, it's going to come down to a series of explanations, just like it does with Jackie. Here's a diagram that I think illustrates all of the pieces that have to be in place. Number one, we have to understand the, what, what eternity and how eternity impacts the equation. We have to also know the proper uh, role of free agency, the proper definition of love, how God might use this to develop our character, how God might even use this to call us to him. Also, the consequence of our behavior just as uh, a justice demands. And finally, our limited understanding as humans. Now, you can see the diagram is pretty complex. And I think for purposes of us discussing this, much of this is going to be in your participant's guide, okay? Because we can't go through all eight or seven of these pieces of evidence uh, or reasons, explanations in one setting. But I will try to do a couple that I think were so foundational for me as an atheist looking at the existence of God and trying to explain how evil could exist in the universe. Here's the first one. What do we mean when we say eternity changes everything? And it does in this equation. It's the first thing in the diagram. Well, let's put it this way. When I was an atheist, I believed that my life was a line segment. Follow me. Starts with birth, ends with death. Two points, there's a line in between. I wanted the line to be 90 years. Just give me 90 years. 90 pain-free years. I don't want to ever suffer, ever experience any tragedies. I want to die peacefully in my sleep at the age of 90 after a very full and enjoyable life. That was my hope, right? Because for me as an atheist, everything had to occur in those first 90 years. 
Now, if I'd have gotten sick with, say, the cancer or some other disease at 40 and suffered 10 years and died at 50, I'd have been upset. I would have seen that as evil. Why? Because I had an expectation of 90 years on the timeline, and now the last half is being stolen from me. I'm not going to realize what I expected to begin with. I'd have seen that as evil. But what if my notion, my foundational notion of what life is, was wrong to begin with? What if life is not a line segment, but is instead a ray that starts at birth, extends through a point we call our death, but then goes off infinitely, eternally into the future like a ray? That's what rays do. They start, go through a point, and continue indefinitely. That would change everything. There are people who are watching this right now, maybe even in your group, that are watching this and have experienced some evil, some difficult surgery, maybe in the first few weeks of life. And if I would have stopped the camera right there and said, how's life going for you? You'd have said, it stinks. Okay, it's, it's terrible. All I'm experiencing is pain. But by the time you were three, you didn't even remember it. Uh, really? I had a surgery when I was, I didn't, I don't know, I didn't. Why? Because you con the context of your life determines the way you perceive evil. That was something you had to endure for a short period of time. By the time you're three, four, five, you've already forgotten about it. Now think about this. If life is a ray and not a line segment, every year that you step into eternity, that 90-year period is shorter and shorter and shorter by comparison to eternity. You might suffer something, you might have a terrible 90 years, but by the time you're a million years into eternity, that 90 years is a millisecond compared to your experience with God in eternity. If life is as Christianity describes it, the problem of evil has to be mitigated in some way. Look, I get it. Evil's a problem for me as an atheist, when I was an atheist, because I always thought everything had to happen in 90 years. But if that view is incorrect, if the Christian worldview is true, all of us are eternal creatures, and no matter what happens to you, it has to be measured in the context, not of 90 years, but of eternity. That's why eternity changes everything. Okay, look at our diagram again for a second. So we've looked at just one of seven explanations for why God might allow any act of evil. The other six we'll cover in the participant's guide. But even this, the issue of eternity, goes a long way to explain why God would allow something bad to happen to us. He's not concerned about your comfort in your material life. He's concerned about your character through eternity. But we don't even know, really, if you look at this, what his priorities are. I mean, we don't know if his first priority is which one of those seven things. All of this has to go into our description of why God would allow anything to happen. But now let me ask you this. Why are you calling this thing evil to begin with? Because you don't like it? You don't like what happened to Jackie? Look, if you don't like it, you can. If, if evil is just the stuff you don't like, well, you could actually eliminate all evil tomorrow. You know how you do it? Change your mind. But that won't get it done. You know that what happened to Jackie was truly evil. It broke a standard beyond your personal opinion, even beyond the opinion of your group. In other words, there's a standard that transcends all of us that you are measuring something against to determine that it's evil. C.S. Lewis once said it this way too. He, he said he used to complain about God's existence because the world is so unjust. But what was he measuring against when he called the world unjust? If there is no objective, transcendent, holy standard of righteousness, then there is no true evil. There's just stuff you don't like. But because there is true evil, we know there must therefore be an objective standard of righteousness. You cannot have the shadows without the sunlight. The shadows prove the sunlight. So even to say that something is evil is not to say that it eliminates God's existence. You couldn't have true evil if there wasn't a God to set the standard for righteousness. So let's go back to our diagram for a second. It used to be that people would say, hey, evil is that one thing that eliminates God from the equation. But it turns out you can't have that thing unless there is a God to set the standard. So evil is not exculpatory. It's inculpatory. It actually points, like all the other seven pieces, to the existence of God as the standard. Look at our suspect description now. Just look at it for a second. Do you see what I see? Everything we've talked about in all those eight pieces, it's there on that list, right? 
It's there on that list, the uh, timeless nature of God, his, his non-material nature, everything from cosmology. He's a designer who fine-tunes the universe, is the author of the code and DNA. He's a mind who acts freely. All those attributes are there. He's also the standard for all moral truth, all moral righteousness by which we call something evil. Now look, here's why I offer this. If all I had was the evidence in the universe from science and philosophy, that's all I have, okay? I have no holy scripture, nothing. No holy book of any kind. I would have this suspect description we just described. I would be stuck looking for a suspect who fits that description. And it turns out that that description is exactly what we classically describe Yahweh as. The God of the Bible is that description, and we didn't open a single page of scripture to get there. We got that description from just the physical evidence in the universe. Isn't it nice to know that our scripture actually describes the world the way it really is? Now, look, people will try to offer other explanations for that evidence, and they will offer a multitude, and they do not agree with each other. The science does not agree with itself. You've got cosmologists who will argue over each and every piece of evidence, four, five, six different camps that are all in disagreement. They offer a multitude of coincidental explanations. And by the way, whatever they're using to explain the beginning of the universe, they're not using to explain moral law. They've got an entirely different set of explanations for all eight pieces of evidence. That's one way to describe the evidence. That's one way to account for it. There's another way. There might just be one causal suspect that explains all the evidence, that unifies the entire evidence set. It's not this amazing cosmic coincidence of unrelated explanations. Instead, it's one, one explanation that can account for, for everything, from the beginning of the universe to even the standard by which we call something evil. We've been looking for a theory of everything to unify quantum mechanics, quantum uh, physics to, to macro. Uh, think about it, there is a theory of everything. It's called God. That's the one thing that explains all the evidence in the universe. And we got there by asking the simple question, can we explain everything in the room by staying in the room? You can't. The best explanation is outside the room and it happens to match the God of the Bible.